Hi ladies, I am so excited. We made it! We made it to the last at-home session. We met twice in September, twice in October, and today is our second and last meeting in November. And we did it. Look, mama doesn't have any lipstick on. I forgot my earrings today. But look, nothing is gonna stop us from having a great time in the Word. And today we are diving into God's nature and the characteristic we are really unpacking is God is generous. So we've been on this incredible journey together and we're gonna cap it off with God is generous. Now, before we dive into that, I wanna remind you, we're having a huge party, a huge celebration on December the 3rd at Celebration Church. Tickets are available now, it's 10 bucks, it's childcare, it's catered, it's a photo booth, it's a pro photo booth with souvenirs, and it's a concert slash worship event. And we are gonna dive into the um, Christmas story in a fresh way. Because how many of you know you have never worked so hard unless you are a woman at Christmas? It is crazy. Women make Christmas happen. And so before you make it happen for your kids and your grandkids and your friends and your family, come get filled up, get encouraged in the true meaning of the season and the reason for this season on December 3rd at seven o'clock right here at Celebration Church. So I can't wait to see you there. But today we are diving into God is generous. I love it when I can surprise my kids with something. And you're probably like this too. Like you're at the store, mine are older now. I have a 15 year old and a 13 year old. And I love it that when I'm shopping for her, I'll like see a little top and I'm like, Avery would love that. And so I just pick it up. Or I'm, I'm at a football game hypothetically speaking, and I'm ringing a cowbell as loud as I can, and I'm cheering just so number 63 knows that I saw how good that tackle was. And I just love the expression on my kids' faces when they receive something from me as a mom that they weren't expecting, whether it's a shirt from the mall or it's some acknowledgement of, I saw that tackle. And when you and I, we know what that feels like when we choose to bless someone unexpectedly. We, the return we get, money, money, you can't put a price on it. It's really hard to even just describe that feeling in your heart. It's like the little Grinch movie where we saw that, where it's like his heart grew two sizes that day. We know that feeling. And Jesus kind of pulls back the curtain on the character of God in um, Matthew 7, 11. He says, if you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more does our Father in heaven know how to give good gifts? I love that verse. Another verse is in Romans. It's actually Romans 8, 32. If God did not withhold even his son, how much more will he graciously give us all that we need? There are a lot of things you could ask me for, but my children are 100% always off the table. But God did not even withhold his own son. How much more will he graciously give us all that we need? The nature of our God is generous. And I want to unpack a story that I feel like really helps us um, understand the depth and the scope of God's generous nature. And it's in Genesis chapter 14. And if you have that, um, if you have a Bible with you where you're at, you can turn there. We're going to be really camped in Genesis 14, and then we're going to read a little bit in Genesis 15. And all the notes are in your app, so you can go home and kind of really meditate on it and really kind of sink your teeth into it when we have some more time together. But in Genesis 14, what I see is this working definition of generous. Generous, when I looked it up, it said generous is readiness to give more of something than is necessary or expected. That's what Merriam-Webster says generous is. But here, for our, for our working definition, to be generous is to give without the expectation of return. If you give something, and expect a return, that is not being generous. That's just making an investment. <laughs> You're investing in something, expecting a return. 
the, this is what school fundraisers do all the time. They, they take the kids and they hype them up and they show them all those really great prizes they're going to get if they sell this many candy bars or this many magazine subscriptions. And as parents, we have been down that road a thousand times. I am just like, please, I would rather just make a donation to the PTO than to have to sell these candy bars. Because they hype up the kids and say, if you do this, if you are generous and sell all these candy bars for our school, then you'll get this awesome prize pack. Well, that's not being generous. That's an investment because there's an expectation of return. But our God is generous. He gives and there is no expectation of return. And when you and I walk through Genesis 14, we see that character on full display and it builds our faith. It is going to grow our faith and it is going to challenge you and I to trust God in a way we've never trusted him before because we see his generous nature. So let's get into Genesis 14. I've got three takeaways for you. The first one is this. God rescues people because he is good and not because they deserve it. <laughs> That's how generous he is. God rescues people because he is good and he is generous and not because they deserve it. Genesis 14, Abram, his nephew is a guy named Lot. Lot is living in a town called Sodom and Gomorrah. I'm going to guess you've heard of Sodom and Gomorrah. You don't have to be a Bible scholar to have heard the name Sodom and Gomorrah. Pretty famous town. Thoroughly pagan, thoroughly demonic, really bad news. In fact, in three more chapters, it's about to be destroyed by fire and brimstone. These people have done absolutely nothing to deserve God's favor. But God is so good. He enables Abraham to rescue his nephew Lot who has been taken captive because these five kings come against the city of Sodom and take everyone in that city and everything they own and take possession of it. And one man escapes and gets to Abraham and says, you have got to help your nephew Lot. And Abraham takes 318 men and he goes and he rescues an entire city. Could not have done it without the help of the living God. God rescues people who, who don't even deserve it because he is simply good and kind and generous. And let me just put this little thought. Sometimes God rescues people for your sake. You can be the person who is standing in the gap for someone a lot in your life. <laughs> And they don't even know what they don't know. But for your sake, the Lord will rescue that person. I know mom after mom after mom who is standing in the gap for her children. And she's saying, Lord, rescue my children for my sake. I know professional women who are like, Lord, you have got to bless this boss. You have got to bless this enterprise. You have got to bless this, this organization for my sake. That is how generous our God is. He will bless others for your sake. And he does it without any expectation of return. So Abram rescues Lot, this entire city of Sodom. And the king of Sodom is with them. And they are caravanning, making their way back to the city when they are greeted by a guy called King Melchizedek in Genesis chapter 14. And the second takeaway I have for you is that our God is so generous. The only way we can bless others is because he's blessed us first. The only way we can bless others is because he's blessed us first. This king comes out and he meets Abram. And the first thing he does is he blesses him. He gives him wine and bread and blesses and speaks a blessing over him. Abraham has just fought all night. 318 men have just defeated five kings and their armies, and they do it in the dead of night, Scripture tells us. Abram is pretty weary at this point, and he is dragging an entire city and people and their goods back to where they live. And he's looking over his shoulder the whole time because what's to say those five kings aren't going to regroup and try to take another swing at him? In this moment, he's greeted by 
King Melchizedek, who is the king of Salem. Now there's a lot of theories that theologians have on who this King Melchizedek is. He's, he's mentioned in Genesis chapter 14, he's referenced in a few of the Psalms, and then he's referenced again in Hebrews 6. And there are a lot of theories, but most theologians agree that King Melchizedek is a type and shadow of Christ because he comes with communion, wine and bread, and he speaks a blessing over Abraham that is the first time we hear the word El Elyon, that God reveals himself, a nature of himself, a name that he has that mankind has never heard before. And it's in Genesis chapter 14, verse 18. It says, then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. And he blessed Abram, saying, Blessed be Abram by the Most High God, creator of heaven and earth. And blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. Then Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. So in that moment, Melchizedek speaks this blessing over Abraham, and he uses El Elyon. First time we've ever heard that that name of God. And I highly recommend, there's an awesome book called Hallowed Be Thy Names by uh, Pastor David Wilkerson. If you haven't picked it up yet, it's a couple dollars off Amazon. Incredible book. It walks through all of the names that God has for himself in the Hebrew. And God, it's like, you can't just describe God as God. It's Jehovah Jireh, God my provider. Jehovah Shalom, God my peace. El Elyon, creator most high, possessor of heaven and earth. In layman's terms, what Melchizedek has just told Abraham is that God created it all and God owns it all. And Abraham has this revelation of who God is now. And it is changing his perspective enormously because because Melchizedek has blessed Abraham, Abraham turns around and he blesses Melchizedek and gives him a tenth of all the plunder that they just had. You and I are able to bless others because everything that we have came from God himself first. John 3, 27 says, man has nothing except that which was, was in heaven first. James puts it this way, he says, all good gifts come from the Father of light with whom there is no shadow of turning. The only reason you and I are able to do anything, possess anything, is that we are basically stewards of what God has entrusted to us to care for. We love because he first loved us and we give because it's been given to us. And Abraham has that revelation of El Elyon and he sees that and he goes, I can't let you give me bread and wine and I can't let you bless me in this way without me blessing you in return. Now it's really, really curious. The king of Sodom is watching this whole display between Abraham and Melchizedek and he pipes up and he tells Abraham, hey, um, you keep all the plunder. I don't, I don't want any of the plunder. Give me the people and we'll call it a day. It's so interesting to me. The king of Sodom hasn't even told Abraham, thank you for rescuing me from those five bad guys, but he sees this, this generosity on display from Melchizedek to Abraham and Abraham back to Melchizedek. And then he goes, hey, 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 I want a piece of that action, but I don't want the stuff. I want the souls. And I want to challenge you with the thought. Every day there are two kings competing for your obedience. God does not want your money. He wants your obedience. He wants you to just acknowledge him as your source. He is El Elyon, creator of heaven and earth, possessor of heaven and earth. He made it all, he owns it all. And he wants to put it in your hands to steward with it. And he wants you to acknowledge his lordship in your life. He wants your obedience. Well, guess what? The king of Sodom, <laughs> The opposite side of the table, the enemy of our souls, he wants your obedience too. He's not after your money. He just wants the obedience in the souls. And that's the juxtaposition between the two. And that's what you and I have to decide. 
which one we're going to give our obedience to. So it's just food for thought. That's Melchizedek. Now the third takeaway I want to just build on a little bit, and it is the name El Elyon, and, it, and we build off that. The, the next chapter in Genesis chapter 15, because Abraham has this revelation of who God is, he made it all, he owns it all. In Genesis chapter 15, after he has tucked Lot and all those people, they've gone back to Sodom. The Lord comes to Abraham in a vision. And he says in Genesis 15, 1, after this, so after all that stuff with Sodom and Gomorrah, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision. And he said, do not be afraid, Abraham. I am your shield and your very great reward. And Abraham said, O oh, sovereign Lord, but he used the word El Elyon. He had just learned it the chapter before. Oh, El Elyon. What can you give me since I remain childless and the one who will inherit my estate is Eleazar of Damascus? You have given me no children. Abraham has had this revelation that God, you created it all and you own it all. And I love that you are going to be my reward and you are my shield because frankly, I am going to need a shield because I just ticked off five kings and they could be looking for me as we speak. And God, I thank you that you were my reward because I just gave King Melchizedek a tenth of everything. And I told the king of Sodom, look, I don't want anything you've got. I've just had a revelation that I have a relationship and a connection to the God who is most high possessor of heaven and earth. So I don't even want a shoelace from you, King of Sodom, because I clearly am tied in to the living God. That just happened in chapter 14. And in chapter 15, he says, El Elyon, creator and possessor of heaven and earth, I still need a son. Here's the revelation and here's what I want to encourage you with. You can be sitting at a crossroads of an impossible situation where in the natural, you cannot see a way out. But I want to challenge you. Your God is a creator and not a created. He is above natural order. He created it all. He owns it all. And if he needs to do a miracle to get what he's called to your life to come to fruition, he can do it. He is not bound by natural time and space and physics. And what he's telling Abraham in chapter 15 is, Abraham, I know you're 90. I know Sarah is 80, but if I have to create life in a body that is virtually dead so that you can have a son, I can do that. That's no problem. Mom and dads, ladies and gentlemen <laughs> of all ages, if you're at a crossroads in your life, do not think that God has to come up with a natural solution to make sure that you get what you need in the moment that you need it. You serve a God who is a creator, and if he has to just create something, he'll do it to make sure that you have it. He is not bound by time or space. He has absolutely no limitation before him because he is El Elyon, creator of heaven and earth, possessor of heaven and earth. And in that moment, in that revelation, Abraham reminds God, this is who you told me were, you were in chapter 14. And this is who I need you to be in chapter 15. And God loves it when we remind him of what he said and he, we remind him of his word. And he tells him, look, I know, I am El Elyon and you're going to have a son of your own body. I haven't forgotten it. Rest assured, Abraham, I've got you. God is exceedingly generous exceedingly generous. What you and I have to trust him in is his timing. He's not holding out on us. He's not trying to, to stretch a dollar or play the clock out. His timing is perfect. We can trust his nature. He is kind. He is good. He is peace. He is compassionate. He is merciful. And it is all of those things coming together that when he extends his generosity to you and I, it is all of those things and exceedingly generous at the same time. So we can trust his timing.
We can trust the way that he wants to bring it to us. And we can trust that the thing that is coming to us is truly a good thing. It's truly a befitting thing. It is truly exceedingly, abundantly a gracious thing that he's giving to us. Our God is generous. So you're going to have a great discussion right now with your friends and with the circle you're in. And I just, again, want to honor you. Thank you for walking through this series with us. We are just so honored to have done this together. And I hope, and I, I hope that you'll let us know how knowing God's nature has changed your approach has changed your prayer life, has encouraged you to have more faith, to ask God for big things and to trust him with even bigger things. So I can't wait to see you December 3rd and I hope you have an incredible time of discussion and I'll see you soon. Bye.